God forgives our sins. Amen? I'm going to try it again. That's, that's a whole church ought to jump out of your skin, amen, right there, right? <laughs> that's why I did it, to wake you up. God forgives our sins, amen? amen. That's right, right? That's, that's pretty powerful stuff, right? I, actually, it's beyond power. It's, it's amazing. It's awesome, right? It's, it's incredible that God can do that for us. And, and, and uh, for those of us who are Christians and believe, it, it's really, it's like, water in a, in a desert when you're thirsty, right? I mean, it, it's, it's saved us, it's rescued us, it's changed us, it's, it's pumped life into us because uh, we realize uh, that, that we are sinners, right? And as we mature as Christians and as we, we, uh, we, we grow as Christians, we, we see, one, that, that we are uh, more of sinners than we thought we were, but we also start to uh, under, understand, be able to sin less, right? So for now, we realize though that we are nothing without God, that we have to have God to forgive our sins, that it's not what we've done, but what God's done. And that's pretty powerful stuff, right? We all know a passage in Psalm 103 that says uh, God casts our sins as far as the east is from the west, right? He, he puts them out, right? If you, if you ever get discouraged or ever have a hard time uh, getting over uh, sin in your life or forgiving yourself, read Psalm 103 because as David hears these words that we started out with this morning, that God forgives our sins, David can't help but put pen to paper and praise God in a great way. And he, he, he goes off in Psalm 103 and just glorifies God for God taking away his sins. He does the same for us. And, and what it should do is excite us as Christians to know that, that as imperfect and as flawed and as messed up as we are at times, that God forgives our sins. That's why we, we celebrate with communion. And, and I call it celebrate, not because we celebrate the, the death of Jesus, but because we celebrate what that meant for us. Right? It, it means that our sins are washed away. Right? And as we read there, we, we proclaim, we remember, we say again that, that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. But we know that's not where the story ends, right? We're going into Easter season and we know that he didn't stay in the tomb, that he rose from the grave and, and he conquered death and he wants to deliver us there with him as well. That's the exciting gospel message that we as Christians believe, right? God forgives our sins. I, I want to read a passage from this, uh, this book here. From, uh, it's by Charles Swindell, and, and, um, and it helps to kind of paint a picture of what it, it is uh, to, to understand the truth that God forgives our sins. He says this, Think of a cross. The larger of the two beams is vertical. Think of the vertical beam as your relationship with God. Throughout our lives, we crawl up that beam carrying the weight of our sin. We're not perfect, and we're still growing in maturity, which means we've still got sin. So we crawl up that beam, and we say, Lord, I've gotten myself into this mess, and I confess it to you. I was wrong, and I regret it. I failed again, and I bring this before you. The Lord never responds, shame on you. Crawl back down and get out of my sight. Pay penance for the next three weeks. Never. He says, as you crawl back down, go away cleansed and clear and forgiven. So back down we go, glad to be forgiven only to sin again. Then we're back up on that beam again. Consequently, the Christian life can feel like a yo-yo, up and down, up and down. As we get older and we learn our lessons better, we crawl up that beam a lot less frequently, but we never reach the point of never needing to seek God's forgiveness. Fortunately, his forgiveness never runs out. The more difficult part of the cross is the horizontal beam. This represents our relationship with the world. While God forgives our sins and wipes the slate clean in terms of our relationship with Him, our wrongdoing may have lingering consequences with others. God forgave the sin, but He didn't change the events to reverse the effect of our sin in the world. For example, if in the act of pure carelessness you were to run over your neighbor's beloved pet, God would forgive you and your friend might forgive you, but the animal would remain dead. The consequences of your carelessness linger. On a more serious note, let's say someone abused drugs or alcohol for half his life. He was taught better, but began to cultivate a habit, and before long, he became addicted. The addiction only got worse until he, became, he began to lose everything that was important to him. Career, family, friends, health, everything. After years of abusing his body and destroying his relationships, he brought his addiction to God and began the long process of recovery. 
He has received God's forgiveness and perhaps the forgiveness of friends and family, but the trouble is the long-standing wounds remain. The years lost to his addiction are gone. His health is forever compromised. The consequences of his sin linger. Some people have problems with anger. They carry a reservoir of rage that comes out in harsh, sometimes profane words. A mother reaches her boiling point and screams her frustration at her children with name-calling and insults. As her temper cools and she has a little time to reflect, she regrets her behavior. She kneels before the Lord, saying, Lord, I sinned. I need help with this problem. Please forgive me. So here's the thing with sin, is that God will always forgive us. There's, there's no question. Sin is forgivable. If we ask, God forgives us. But uh, the problem is, it's not always erasable. It's forgivable, it's not always relaceable. Re- Erasable. You can't take those words back. You can't take those lost years back. You can't take those, those hurtful things that happen to the ones around you back. You, you can't. That sin has a consequence. That sin has some long-lasting effects. And the sad thing about sin is that sin doesn't just affect the guilty. Right? Sin affects some innocent people around it. Charles goes on here to describe sin kind of like a, a, a terrorist bomb in a mall. Right? It doesn't only affect the ones closest to it, but the, the shrapnel goes on for a while. It, it reverberates. The, the pain, the hurt, the suffering goes on and, and touches everybody around. Sin is a bad thing. We know that. But we've really got to think about what sin can do and what sin has done in our lives and the lives of of the ones around us. And that's kind of what we pick up here with in Genesis. A story of a sin that had some consequences that that reverberated, that lived a long time, that, that went out there for a while and have had impacts um, in, in the lives of a lot of people that were kind of just innocent bystanders in the process. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to, to Genesis 21. We'll pick up where we left off last week at verse number 8. But before we get there, let's get some background. Right? Just so we know where we're at, right? We're, we're caught up. The first seven verses of chapter 21 is where we see God's promise fulfilled. And we can throw the word finally in there, right? God's promise finally is fulfilled. After waiting a long time, Abraham and Sarah welcome into the world their son, Isaac. But that's, that's not the, the first that they've tried to fulfill God's promise, is it? About 15 years before Isaac was born, they had their own plan, Remember? Back in like Genesis 16, they had their own scheme. They decided they're going to go out their own way. They're going to do things in their own time because they're tired of waiting on God. So they, they push it. They do their own stuff. And what happens? Well, a, a son is born to Hagar. His name is Ishmael. Now, he lived in this house with this wealthy, prominent, powerful man, Abraham, for 15 years as Abraham's, at that time, only son. He was there in the household living, and, and it, was, it was all good. Right? Now, anybody who has had a second kid knows how the first kid sometimes suffers when the second one comes in to be, right? Unless you're the, the, old, unless you're the younger kid, you, you, you understand this, right? When, when my sister was born, I was in the hospital the, the night she was born, and uh, when the doctor came out and told us that she was born, I cried and hid under the chairs in the waiting room. I was... Not exactly happy. Well, I think I was more unhappy she was a girl. Uh, I wanted a, a boy sister is what I wanted, but that didn't, that didn't happen. Right, so I cried. I hid. That's what happens when, when the older kid is, then, uh, is, is introduced to this life with somebody else. Can you imagine Ishmael going through the same thing? Right? He's just a normal kid. He's a 15-year-old kid that now has a little baby brother. But to make things more complicated, Ishmael now realizes that he's not... He's not the chosen one, right? He's not the one that was, was promised by God. He's not the one that was, uh, was kind of uh, the, guaranteed to, to be the heir of Abraham and his descendants. So he, he realizes where his place is. He's been there 15 years. He's the elder of the two. He's the big brother, and yet he's not going to get the place that his little brother gets. And you can imagine that would weigh on a, on a, on a child. Um, and a 15-year-old boy probably makes it a little bit worse. Right? Anybody who has a 15-year-old boy understands that, right? Yes. Uh, so that's what happened. Now, it's been a few years, okay, as we start this out. It's been a few years. 
And, and is, so Isaac is, is about three years old. That puts, uh, that puts Ishmael 17, 18 years old, okay? He, he's in that area where he is um, he's, he's a man, right? He's probably, they're working on arranging his marriage. They're working on who is going to be his wife. They're, they're putting all that together for his future to go out into his life and, and, and make it on his own. But all this time, as he's been growing up, his his feelings toward this child have just kind of come to a boiling point. And where we pick up the story in verse 8 is at this big family celebration. To celebrate Isaac uh, being three years old, the, the age to be weaned, it's, it's a big deal. It's a, it's a family celebration. And as many family celebrations have, drama ensues, right? And that's kind of what happens here in verse 8. So let's look at that. So the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day Isaac was weaned. So Isaac's three, Ishmael about 17. Look at verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom he, she, she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. And my, my version says scoffing. Yours may say mocking. Scoffing, mocking, making fun of. Right? Now, that's obviously a 15-year-old making fun of, poking fun at a three-year-old. It, it's, it's brotherly love at its best. Right? That's what brothers do. But it's not really a good thing, right? And, and we can understand that. Now, I, I, I know that mothers are very protective, right? That they are. That's just by nature. Uh, I, I don't, this would be, make a, a 93-year-old mother uh, watching her toddler be picked on by a 15-year-old that she kind of has got hard feelings toward anyway. It's not going to be a very good sight. Right? So here's this, this family drama finally coming to this boiling point. Right? So what happens in verse 10? Therefore she, Sarah, said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. So I'm seeing in here a little bit of the protective mama coming out here. I'm also seeing a little bit of jealousy. She's not really feeling too comfortable with the situation, right? She's not happy. So she sees him being picked on. Oh, again, that's not a great thing to do. Okay, I understand. Right? Not, not the, the best idea for a 15-year-old to pick on a 3-year-old. And, and in the past, Hagar hasn't exactly been the nicest always to Sarah, right? There was some, some initial struggles there uh, in the beginning. But that's no reason really to cast them out. But that's what she says. Cast out these people. Kick them out. Get rid of them. Now Abraham is here kind of stuck in the middle. He's not innocent in this whole thing, is he? Not by any means. But he's here stuck in the middle. He loves his wife, Sarah. He loves his son, Isaac, with, with everything he's got. He realizes the child, the promise that God had given. It's a great gift. He gets that. But he also loves Ishmael. That's his son too. But here he is, stuck in the middle, trying to figure out what's going on because he realizes that they can't go on like this the rest of their lives. An Ishmael and Isaac feud, if it's already happening at 15 and 3, what's it going to be like when he's, it's 18 and, and, and uh, 30? That's going to be a, a struggle, right? That's not going to work. So Abraham's trying to resolve family issues, and at the same time trying to figure out what to do. How can he, he make all of this work with the two sons he loves and, and the fight that's about to go on? He's right there in the middle, and, and look how it affects him. Verse 11, the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Well, he's not happy about it. Right? You've you got to give Abraham a little bit of credit here. He thinks about it. He feels bad about it. But there's also probably a little bit more to it. Custom of the day. Now, there's no written down laws in Abraham and his tribe. I mean, he's the powerful one, right? But, but in, in custom in the day, people around there uh, say that you can't really cast out a, a, a servant and their child, if that's what you had, when you get an heir. So, so this had happened before. Okay? This wasn't, Abraham wasn't the first one to experience this. It was written down in laws around in the area that you can't just do that. So he probably would have obeyed that custom. He wouldn't would have wanted to do that. So now he's, he's thinking, how am I going to look? How is this going to be? That seems wrong to me. But there was a practice that you could give your servant her freedom, and she'd be willing to, to go and leave and take her, her heir with her, and she would then be freed from, 
from the, the bondage of, of servanthood, but she would also lose any rights she had and ties back she had to the family. Abraham probably tried to convince her of that scenario, right? Or, or at least offered that to her and said, you're free to go. But can you imagine having that conversation and that, and that thought he had to have with her? He had to feel bad. But don't you think he's also kicking himself for some past sin? Like, what did I do here? What did I get myself into? What kind of mess have I created? But as he's trying to plan out how he's going to tell Hagar and his son Ishmael that they have to leave, he's probably saying, this is all my fault. Look at what I've done. And it seems like a long time, 15 years ago of sin, right? And they'd lived with it and they'd made it and they'd suffered through it and, and all these things that had boiled up before they had dealt with, but now, now it's getting to him. But we, we see some maturity here by Abraham. He, he goes to God because look at the next couple verses. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. So Abraham, distressed, displeased, upset, goes to God. And God says, listen to Sarah and, and let her go, because I've got this. I've got it. It's all going to be okay. I'm going to use him. He's going to be a nation as well. He's going to be blessed. Everything's going to be okay. I've got it. So, so Abraham does. That's what he does. Now, I get that he listens. Right? I, I get that. It's got to be a struggle. But he realizes that, that God's, uh, God's got it. Right? But look at what happens in verse 14. Remember, Abraham is rich. He's about to put his son out into the desert. And look, uh, look what happens. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He took bread and a skin of water and put it on her shoulder. Gave it, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. This rich guy, with all these provisions, sends his son and his mother out with a skin of water and some bread. Seems a little harsh, right? I don't think Abraham did that necessarily because he trusted that God would be providing. I think he was, uh, I think that was just probably Sarah wouldn't let him take any more of Isaac's inheritance. I'm sure that was the debate that was raging in his head. But we have to understand here, I think, that Abraham had faith that if that's all he gave, that God would keep his promise. Remember the famine back a while back with Abraham and, and Sarah, back when it was Abram and Sarah? They didn't have provisions. What'd they do? They lied, they schemed, they tried to get their own way. But here we see Abraham maturing in faith and saying, God's told me he's going to make this the son of mine into a nation. He's going to do that. Whether I give him food and water or start him off on the right path, God has this under control. So I think we see Abraham's faith, even in this bad situation, kind of showing itself a little bit. But poor Hagar here now is with her son wandering around in a desert with nothing but a skin of water and some bread out into this desert, this barren wasteland. There's nothing there. It's the wilderness. It's a desert. It's dry. It's not a place that, that life really needs to be. And she's off here on her own. Look at the next couple of verses. And the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him in a distance, of about a bow shot. For she said to himself, Let me not see death of this boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. Now this is it's a very bad place that Hagar finds herself in here. And it's a place that a lot of people find themselves in too. If you, you've done any single parenting, you realize this, right? You're out there all alone, maybe because of something you did or not. Right? Here's Hagar. Not by anything she's done. She didn't cause this problem. And yet there she is, alone. And whether she caused it or not, she's by herself. She's got no one to rely on, but she's got her and a child to take care of. A lot of people get this, right? Survival in itself may just be a struggle. And for Hagar at this point in time, it was. She was outcast, set out. And maybe you, if you find yourself alone, feel the same way. Like an outcast, forgotten about, abandoned, cast away. 
That's where she's at, in the barren wilderness by herself. Because people will, will wonder, people will think, people will uh, suppose, but not everybody will help. And there she is. She's there by herself, alone, with nothing, trying to take care of, of her children. Single parents get this. It's a difficult time. Right? Memories are there of what it used to be. I'm sure she remembers back when she was with Abraham. Right? Holidays are a dreadful time because you think of the times when things could have been better. Memories are sad. In, in, in summary, your soul is parched. Some of us understand that. We, we've been there, alone, by yourself, abandoned, cast out, suffering through something, and you just feel parched. You feel alone. You feel abandoned for whatever reason. Maybe it's a mistake you made or a relationship you broke, or maybe it's, it's some shrapnel that hit your life and destroyed you as, uh, and, and as an innocent bystander or someone else sinned. I don't, I don't know what it is, but I think we've all been there in our own wilderness, trying to figure out how we're going to survive, trying to figure out are we really by ourselves. I'm sure Hagar felt that way. I mean, she felt that way enough to put her boy under a shrub and then go away so she couldn't see him. That's a, that's a pretty sad state that she was in. But what can we learn from this? We can see we're not alone. You think you're by yourself, you think you're abandoned, you think you're outcast, you find yourself in a wilderness struggling to survive. Know this, you are not alone. Know that you will get through the wilderness that you will get whole again, and when you recover, you will be stronger than you were when you went in. That's what God does, because God hears you, because God listens. Look at the next couple of verses. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel called out to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation." Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. God hears. And how does God answer? He opens her eyes. Look, he says, open your eyes, and there's a well in front of her. That was there the whole time. God didn't make the well. God said he opened her eyes, and she saw a well. It had been there forever. But here's the thing. You all know this. When you're suffering and hurting and struggling, and, and when you're in that wilderness, when you're in the middle of a messy situation, you can't see past your own misery. And that's where Hagar was. But know this, because this turns everything around. Know this, that God hears you. God listens. God pays attention. And God wants you to have your eyes opened by Him. Because that changes your whole outlook on life. That changes everything. The way you see the world around you, the way you see your mess and the situation you're in changes when God's in it. Here's a fact. If you stay bitter, if you stay upset, if you stay mad at your circumstances, you will starve. If you look at just the mess and the problems and the suffering and try to put blame and, and point fingers, you'll starve. But if you look to God for provision... And then God will open your eyes and God will rescue you. Because God provides. God takes care of us. God hears us. Right? That's in the good times and in the bad. That's in, and on top of the mountain and down in the valley. That's what God wants from us. And that's what God did here. He heard Hagar's cry. He heard Ishmael's cry. And he answered. And he opened her eyes. And he said, here you go. And right then, everything turned around. Right then, it's like, it's like God said, hey, Hagar, I'm here. I've got you. I am, I'm listening to you. And something inside Hagar said, okay, good. I, I've got it. I, I realize that. I'm going to rely totally on you, God, not on myself or on my power or on what I can provide, but on what you can provide. And her whole outlook in life changed. Because look at the next couple of verses. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. She didn't give up. They went on with life. And Ishmael went on to have 12 sons and, and who knows how many daughters, right? He had a big family, right? The, the Arab people of today trace their lineage to Abraham through Ishmael. 
So he's got a great nation, right? He, he did that. But you also see the conflict that exists between the, the, the people of Abraham, the Hebrews, right? The people that came through Isaac and the people that came through Ishmael. For centuries, there's been a conflict there. And not because anything any one of those two sides did, but because of a sin by Abraham thousands of years ago. Because right? sin reverberates. Sin impacts. Sin affects all of us, uh, regardless of, of our guilt or innocence. If we're around it, we're impacted by it. That's what sin does. Sin is there. It's a mess. It messes things up. But God is there and can work through it and in it and won't forget you in the middle of it. It's a, it's a pretty short little story here, a pretty short little few verses about what happened with Ishmael and Hagar, but we can learn quite a bit. Because if you look at it, you probably relate to, to one of the three main characters here, right? You probably relate to Hagar or Ishmael or, or Hagar or Abraham or, or Sarah. Okay? Really the three main characters. Let's talk about Sarah first for a while. Sarah uh, is, if there was a villain of the story, it would be Sarah, right? And it was her idea for uh, Hagar to bear the son. That was her idea. She brought that up to Abraham, and he complied. Okay, so then she, there she is. He, she gets mad at her one time, casts her out the one time, right? Makes her feel bad. Now she's back in here. Hagar has been there for a while. Ishmael's been there for a while. She gets jealous again and casts uh, Hagar and Ishmael out into the wilderness again, right? It's, it's one of those things. But what do we realize here? That if we relate to Sarah, if you find yourself relating to Sarah as someone who understands the consequences of sin, that they linger, that there are, are waves that are caused by that sin, maybe you find yourself there. The sin that you started, that you were a part of, is now still affecting your life. Remember this, the past is the past. Did it happen? Absolutely. Was that sin there? Yes. Did you do it? Absolutely. That, that's okay, but we can't, we can't dwell on it right now. We've got to make the best of the now. We've got to make the best of the situation we are in. Here's, here's advice for you if you find yourself as a Sarah. Take that past sin to the cross and leave it there. Leave it there. Don't drag it back with you like a ball and chain around your life. Don't let it weigh you down. And make you dread everything around you in your life. Don't, don't let it hold on to you and affect you and, and affect your decisions. Take it to the cross and leave it. Don't make an excuse. Don't defend your past sin. Every time those thoughts of, of, of making an excuse or rationalizing, you're saying, here's why I sinned. Every time that comes to your mind, use that as a cue to go to the cross and put it back there. Because that's where it needs to be. When Jesus says he forgives the sins, and when David writes that he casts them as far as the east is from the west, he means that. That means forget about them. Let them go. Sins are forgivable. Yes, there may be waves and consequences that aren't erasable, but the sin is gone. The guilt can be too. Leave that at the cross. Maybe you find yourself relating a little bit more to Abraham. Right? In the middle of some kind of, of marriage disagreement. Some kind of relationship disagreement. Maybe you find yourself in the middle of, of not really exactly knowing what to do. We'll, we'll know this. The disagreements in marriage can actually be really great teachers if we take the time to listen. Yeah. Look, I, I think God puts people in our lives for a reason. Right? He, he puts spouses, friends, family in our lives for a reason. Now, we don't always... Uh, understand them. We don't always uh, understand their point of view. And, and sometimes uh, the ones that are closest to us are wrong about the advice they give us. But their perspective can be good, even if it's different from what we see, even if the advice is, is incorrect. Maybe it makes us stop and think a little bit. Lessons come through those that are closest to us if we take the time to listen to them. So maybe you find yourself in that position where somebody close is trying to teach you a lesson or God's trying to teach you a lesson through that and instead of listening, you're, you're rejecting the thought. Or maybe you find yourself as Hagar. Maybe that's who you relate to. You are, are, are regretting um, your, your decision. You're regretting being a part of the situation. You're, you're upset that you were caught in it and you are, are discouraged by it. Know this, these hard situations, these struggles that we have can discourage us absolutely. They can make you think and wonder and question. 
but they cannot cripple you if you don't let them. They can't hold you down. You may be outcast, you may be marginalized, you may be forgot about in the world's eyes, but that's not what happens with God. He hasn't forgot about you. He listens, he cares, he hears your cry, and he wants to be there to bless you. So take your eyes off of people and what they think and what they do and for trying to get help and solutions from people and focus on God because only God can provide. You may not have caused the problem. You may not be the the root cause of why you're there. But the fact is, you are. And you have to live with it. You can live with it and deal with it with a bitter attitude. Or you can deal with it with a triumphant attitude. It's your call. It's your decision. How do you want to approach life? Now for everybody, this this is advice for everybody. Regardless if you relate to one of these three characters or not. Whatever your sin, whatever your struggle, know this this morning, that God is greater. He's bigger. He's more powerful. And He will carry you through. He knows it. He knows you. He knows what you need. And He's there for you this morning. So trust in Him. Look to Him. Let him do what he wants to do in your life because he will bless you. Don't look at the negative. Don't look at the downside. Look at the God who's bigger than that problem. That's where the glory is. Anybody have anything this morning? All right, let's sing one more song.